Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Paul Kalman, naturopathic physician in Portland, Oregon. And this uh, presentation will begin the series on uh, organ systems and organ processes, which I've been talking about for a couple of videos now. Um, this uh, lecture will build on the material from earlier lectures. So if you haven't had a chance to check out some of the other ones, um, you might wanna do that before delving into this material. Uh, I'll include a link in the description to the last lecture. And um, I, I'll try to kind of repeat some of the same themes lecture from lecture so that if you're just jumping in uh, new that um, you can maybe catch on with this. So again, a little bit about this channel, what I'm trying to do here is really um, explore paradigms in medicine and how uh, through doing so, we can really augment what um, I refer to here as the biomedical paradigm or the so-called pathogenic disease paradigm. Um, and uh, this is hopefully to inspire new approaches to chronic disease, not to replace medicine at all, but to expand it to include different areas, different dimensions of the human being that I feel are currently being excluded um, in uh, the bio, current biomedical thinking. Um, it's also a way of maybe developing a more unified model of what is done in a lot of so-called natural medicines. Some people refer to these as Eastern medicines or whatnot. I, I don't like that term because um, a lot of these medicines, some of the more traditional medicines arose in the West, not the East. And um, I don't think that if you, if you go to countries like East Asia currently, the predominant form of medicine that's being practiced is biomedicine or so-called Western medicine. So East-West is maybe not the greatest distinction here, um, but I've referred to the two major paradigms that I've been exploring here, the so-called pathogenic disease paradigm. And the second paradigm is the salutogenic health paradigm. So I'm trying to build this into hopefully a workable clinical system that may be um, advantageous to practitioners. Um, so this is providing maybe more of a grounding to a lot of the more traditional medicines and, and looking for ways of how we can integrate this with current biomedical thinking. Um, in doing so, I've, I found myself that um, my own background is in naturopathic medicine, also Chinese medicine, anthroposophic medicine, Ayurveda, many others. And, and uh, I found that many of these so-called systems of medicine have common themes, have a common underlying philosophy, uh, as well as common ways of knowing, which are very different from the underlying philosophy and ways of knowing of the of current scientific and medical thinking. So I've always been interested in, in the true uh, art of integration. How do we bring these together? So again, just quickly, what I've reviewed in many, many other lectures here is the idea that if we look at the uh, so-called biomedical paradigm, or what I'm calling here the pathogenic disease paradigm, modern or Western medicine, um, this is really based in not just the scientific method as a way of knowing, which is what a lot of people argue is that, well, this is just a way of neutrally gathering information from the world, making hypotheses, and then testing those hypotheses against experiment. Sounds great. But behind that thinking, behind, behind the hypotheses that we form is a whole philosophy, or what I refer to here as an ontology, a belief system about what the world is really made of, what the human being really is, is constituted of. And in particular, there are several sort of key points to this philosophy. One is, of course, materialism, physicalism, that everything that is real is made of matter uh, or material energies. So things like electromagnetism, gravity, and so forth, uh, physical energies. Um, so we can also call this physicalism. So it's really based in substance or particulate thinking. And there's a focus really on solids, measuring solid things and how they interact um, through usually classical mechanisms. So these are like, you know, billiard balls, one bouncing into another, linear cause effect kind of things we can think of in the body, proteins bouncing onto a receptor, stimulating an intracellular signal cascade. That is that linear way of thinking. Um, it's also based in reductionism, which is uh, really this idea that the whole human being, all aspects of the human being ultimately can be explained by matter. Um, and we can reduce ourselves to our parts and those parts can explain the whole. Um, and uh, this is really uh, based on what's called bottom-up causation. If we understand what's happening at the molecular and genetic and cellular level, that will give us an understanding of the whole. And this way of knowing that is used in biomedicine is very much quantitative and statistical and analytical, based again in the scientific method. And that really uh, depends on making definitive measurements, uh, getting data 
from the environment um, that we can measure. Um, as I'll explore here shortly, there are many aspects of the human being, for example, an emotion or a thought that really can't be measured uh, directly. We have to look at indirect measures. And so it becomes a little bit more difficult in those cases. Um, and the intellect, what some have referred to as onlooker consciousness, we try to separate ourselves from the phenomena we're observing and we believe that it's possible is uh, uh, to some degree, at least to a great degree, to separate the observer from what's observed, the subject from the object. But it gives us, unfortunately, the sense that we as human beings are no longer part of the picture. We've sort of made a science and a medicine where we've sort of put ourselves outside the picture. Where does things like the human soul and spirit fit into this picture? And uh, again, that's what I'm exploring with this um, uh, this uh, different paradigm here. So. Um, this is the uh, more uh, linear, we might call it machine-like thinking. Um, in disease, in this way of thinking, is very much on uh, focusing on disease mechanisms, uh, so-called pathogenic mechanisms of disease, looking at lesions like tumors and things we can remove surgically, things like that. Um, and uh, so that's really, we, we emphasize this sort of disease process in this way of thinking. And we have definitive names for diseases and descriptions and biomarkers and everything else associated with that. And then treatment is really aimed at blocking or suppressing these disease mechanisms so they don't destroy the human being in some cases, which is really important. Um, and or we can remove you know, lesions, we can remove organs or parts of organs and replace it with mechanical parts. So that's a huge part of the biomedical thinking is creating how do we replace parts um, and how do we do that effectively. A salutogenic health model, I've argued, is really based on different philosophies. And these are, this is sort of a synthesis of many traditional medicines uh, brought forward into today. But really the idea that, um, that matter and physical energies are not the end all and be all, that there are what we might call supersensory dimensions um, to the world. Um, and um, this is really the consciousness, not matter. Fields of consciousness might be more primary than matter itself. Uh, so I've explored the four fields, the physical, the life field, um, and then the consciousness field, and then the self-consciousness field, and related those to the solid, the fluidic, the gas, light, and the warmth aspects of our being. I, if you wanna look at, uh, know more about that, go back to my previous lectures. Um, another aspect of the salutogenic health model is holism. So we start with the whole, and go down into the parts. And so the parts themselves can't explain the whole. There are emergent properties uh, that happen at different levels, which have their own lawfulness, which need to be interpreted with their own meaning. Uh, and so just looking at genetic molecular mechanisms can't give you uh, the richness that we need to understand these higher parts. Just like in language, if we just study letters and how they're formed, we won't really get the meaning of a text. The meaning comes out at, at another dimension, another level. Um, and this is really working more with non-classical mechanisms. So for example, I've mentioned the possibility of quantum phenomena, superposition, non-locality, uh, resonance transfer of information through water structures, things like that. So you know, we, we open up on a salutogenic health model to non-linear, non-classical mechanisms of information transfer in, in the being. And then this is working more with the top-down causation, saying that the human being is not just a collection of cells, but there is an actual entity, a field, the human field, the human archetype. And um, we identify this with ourself and that this self working through warmth, as I described, works down into matter to shape it. And uh, when we have things like cancer, for example, we, we have a phenomena where cells are really losing that instruction from the higher field. And so they've fallen out of the field. And so the metaphor here, instead of the classic warfare metaphors of the pathogenic disease paradigm, we wanna look more at reintegrating um, these aspects of ourself that have fallen out of the whole in this way. So that's a little bit, again, a, just a brief summary of the philosophy I've discussed in previous lectures. And then the ways of knowing here are more qualitative, uh, looking at pattern recognition, polarities, metamorphosis, these different ideas um, that are more organic. We might call this metamorphic organic thinking versus machine thinking. Um, and he uses the phenomenological method, which says that in addition to my outer sensory observations, my inner feeling states, my inner imaginative pictures actually have a reality to them and they can be useful for understanding phenomena. And if you train many people in these same methods, Although we'd say emotions and imaginative pictures are subjective, 
we interesting interestingly we see that there's a reproducibility that a lot of people will give the same pictures the same um, uh, feelings related to different phenomena so there is something somewhat objective in that subjectivism which can be a very important part of augmenting science um, and again, maybe looking at how we can form new hypotheses and then we can test them quantitatively through the scientific method. But it's, um, it's uh, really acknowledging that we have to, available to us more than just the intellect. When that's what I've referred to based on the work of the Austrian philosopher Rudolf Steiner is the imagination, inspiration and intuition. Uh, three additional modes of consciousness that human beings have available uh, to explore phenomena. And uh, disease really is, uh, in this way of thinking, more um, a, a situation in which the normal forces that maintain health have become imbalanced. So the focus is more on health and maintaining health, or what we might call our inner terrain. Um, and that is what I've referred to here as the salutogenic model based on uh, Antonovsky's work. Um, the medical sociologist who, who coined the term in the late 1970s. And really this is looking at, you know, whole organ systems, glands and whatnot, how they all have come together to maintain our inner terrain or what we call homeostasis in uh, modern physiology. Um, so really it would, the idea here is the disease is really something that results from a distortion of normal homeostasis of terrain, not a separate entity that needs to be fixed in somehow. Instead, we need to restore the balance. Um, so the treatment is really to reharmonize the forces, the organs and glands and whatnot that maintain terrain um, to, to uh, essentially make the inner conditions so that so-called disease processes don't exist. So it's a very different focus than the current models. And I'll have to get into discussing therapeutics and how you know th there's a big difference in how we use therapeutics salutogenically versus pathogenically. Usually we want to use smaller dosages of things to stimulate a response known as the hormesis response, stimulate endogenous healing forces versus suppressing them or overriding your uh, normal physiology. So that's just a little bit about the, um, again, the kind of what, what I've been exploring in these series of videos. Now, again, one big aspect of salutogenic thinking is the idea of holism. And I, I discussed in the last video the idea of holarchy uh, which is an idea that comes from the author Arthur Kessler, first published in The Ghost and the Machine in the 1960s. Um, but Kessler argued that, you know, we can have a whole, but then we can divide that whole into parts, but each part is a reflection of the whole. So it's similar to this idea also of the holographic field. You can take a hologram, a picture, uh, like on a, a, a two-dimensional plate, a holographic uh, image, and you can cut it into parts, but each part still reproduces the whole image. Um, so the idea that, um, yes, we can have a division within holism, but each part is still reflecting the whole. If we start with the whole, the unity, we, and, and I explored this in embryology last time, we have, for example, the fertilized egg, the zygote, and um, we can call that a unity. Um, and then we have the next stage, the so-called blastula develop after implantation, which is sort of a bilaminar germ disc um, where the future embryo will develop from. But the blastula is surrounded by the trophoblast, which will form the chorion and the placenta and whatnot. So the, um, the, there's sort of a polarity that develops here between self and the world, so inside, outside, this sort of thing. So that's, um, and also sort of a top-down axis forms in that second week of embryologic development. Again, this is a summary of things I discussed in the last lecture. And then in our third week of development, roughly, we have the process of gastrulation where we form the trilaminar germ disc of ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and then the three tubes, the neural tube, the, the aorta, and the gut tube. And essentially, we then have this division into three. And this is this important three principles uh, uh, discussion I've had over the last couple of lectures. And this is a very important holistic concept. The idea that if we look at the whole human being, there's essentially a polarity of activities. On one pole, we have the so-called metabolism, which we have concentrated mostly in our metabolic organs. Of course, there's metabolism everywhere in the body, including the brain and whatnot. Um, but our metabolic forces and activities really work with substances. And we're, we're breaking down substances to release energy and rebuilding substances uh, into proteins and fats and, and starches and whatnot, and glycogen. And so we essentially have this constant process, substance-oriented activity. And that's what we study largely in biochemistry. But then something has to regulate all that. 
form the shapes of the human body, uh, organize and inform essentially the, uh, the way that metabolism functions and whatnot. And that comes from our neurosensory system. And so if we look at the nerve processes there, we have more sensing and integrating and forming processes that are active. And then mediating these forming with the substantive processes is a rhythm. And, uh, and if we look at the whole human being, and for example, the skeleton, we find that rhythm represented in thorax with the heart and lung rhythms. Um, we have the rounded gesture of the head represented in the shape of the thorax, and then the linear limb-like gesture, and that's related more to metabolism, we have in the linear ribs. And so we have these two forces brought together. So a more phenomenological view would say these are actual phenomena this is actual these are actual formative forces that are active and we're able to see the imprint of these formative forces in the very structures of our skeleton and again we can go all the way down to an individual cell and see these same three activities at work as well as i've discussed so that's the idea of the the threefold human being well the next division would be then looking at the threefolding within each of the three um, and that gives us if we have an overlap of two of them uh, that gives us the seven life processes so essentially this is the seven basic functions of life and we can say that on the level of the uh not just the physical but the life body the so-called etheric field that i discussed several lectures ago um, there are seven divisions almost like the seven divisions of color on the spectrum so if we're using a field like thinking we can think of these as seven basic frequencies that essentially or waves wave phenomena that essentially govern life processes and you know i describe those as sensing integrating breathing respiration circulation metabolism movement and growth and then reproduction in the last lecture um, and then within each of the three poles all seven are represented so i went into the discussion of how our seven major metabolic organs the the spleen stomach the intestines the liver the kidney bladder and so forth are really represented in metabolism as inverse images of the brain and the brain structures. So there's a relationship between our metabolic organs and the neurosensory organs. They're really polar opposites. And this is important therapeutically because changing one affecting your liver metabolism, your kidney metabolism will have effects on the brain, will have effects on the, um, the actual um, you know, neural processes. And so this can be important when we start talking about mental, emotional uh, or psychological disorders that really a lot of these disorders have at least part of their origin within a disordered organ process. Usually an organ process is too subtle to detect with our current methods, but we can learn how to detect through more subtle uh, methods of observation. These seven processes, I've, I've really uh, emphasized these. You know, we, we see them re reflected in many cultural traditions, for example, in the Ayurvedic or the, in, the ancient Indian Sanskrit and Ayurvedic medicine uh, traditions. We have the idea of the seven chakras, uh, which are essentially another image of these seven. Um, and each of them is represented by an endocrine gland uh, and by a nerve bundle uh, around those glands. So essentially these are seven fundamental divisions that we find, um, but they again regulate all of our life processes. Uh, and then just as a quick recap, went going through that embryologic development in the last lecture, discussed this interesting idea that if we look at the neural tube in the development of the brain vesicles, the three primary vesicles, the hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain, we see a very interesting parallel image in the development of the gut tube into the foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Um, we have in the brain, these areas are generally hollow with the exception of the ventricles, which carry cerebral spinal fluid. But in the gut, these are of course hollow. Your intestines are hollow, but they're filled with the microbiome. Um, and so there's an interesting, we can say these are parallel images of one another. So the large intestine or much of the large intestine has a reflection in the cerebrum. And it's interesting to look at the development of mammals, uh, for instance, the size of the, and the uh, complexity of the large intestine in the complexity of the forebrain. Uh, there's a direct relationship with that. Um, similarly with the midbrain and the hindbrain. These matches are, uh, you know, not so clear cut. There's a little crossover. So if you look, for example, at the forebrain, we have a division into two. One division gives us the thalamus and the hypothalamus pituitary. You say that has a strong relationship to the midbrain. 
And so we can include that in the midbrain and, and then and the cerebral cortex is more the true uh, forebrain from this perspective. Um, but just this general idea that, and this is of course a different interpretation of the so-called gut brain access, that what happens in the gut, we now has direct reflections into the brain and vice versa. So they are inverse images of one another. Um, now, one of the uh, important insights of holism, of course, is that we don't start from the cells, we start from the whole human being and look at disease or illness as a manifestation of that. So a very important concept we'll need moving forward here is the idea that um, disease processes really are a disturbance in the three principles, the three formative activities I just discussed. Um, we can say when these activities are too weak or they're too strong, uh, they result in different disease processes. So for instance, the neurosensory processes, again, which the old alchemical, you know, Paracelsus and other alchemists refer to as the salt processes of consolidation, they're more forming, catabolic, and, and so forth, um, that these processes, if carried too far, lead to too much hardening. And this process traditionally in medicine is known as sclerosis. Um, and so that is a hardening or stiffening. Um, we also have terms like fibrosis, accumulation of collagen, or maybe uh, amyloid plaque, for example, buildup of misfolded proteins within neurons or outside of neurons in the brain, um, and uh, tau proteins, things like that. And then we have mineralization, deposits of calcium, but other heavy metals and things. All of these plaque or atherosclerotic plaque formation, all these would be images of sclerosis, hardening. On the other hand, if the metabolic activities, which the alchemists refer to as the sulfur or phosphor activities, if these processes gain traction and sort of miss, go outside their normal boundaries, we have inflammation, especially what we call acute inflammation. A lot of people talk about inflammation today in medicine, but we have to really differentiate acute versus chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation is uh, good in, in the most cases. Essentially, you sprain your ankle, you have an acute infection. These inflammatory processes bring in warmth. They often dissolve tissues, uh, bring in vitalizing forces. They, they clean out toxins from an area. So acute inflammation really is a good thing. But again, if it goes too far, then we can have you know life-threatening sepsis. We can have in, inflammation invading bony structures and things like that. So again, it can go too far. Um, in between, we have the rhythmical forces, the so-called mercury activity, named after the metal mercury because mercury can assume more of a head-like rounded form versus a more spread out metabolic form. Um, but it's, this is more just a description of the activity. So the rhythmic activity maintains a balance between the hardening neurosensory processes and the warming, softening, um, you know, inflammatory metabolic processes. Um, and so there has to be a constant balance between these two. You say the blood, for example, is constantly on the verge of inflammation, but this is counteracted by the neurosensory processes. And there's a rhythm between that activity. And when that rhythm is disturbed, we have dysrhythmias, but we also have things like chronic inflammation, where we have inflammation together with hardening happening at the same time. Usually when you have acute inflammation, like you sprain your ankle, um, a process sets in where immune cells move in, they begin to dissolve collagen, connective tissues. And then once that process is all done and all that waste matter is cleared up, then the cells move in called fibroblasts to rebuild that area. Um, and so we should have the hardening forming processes happening after the inflammation. Well, in chronic inflammation, you have both going on at the same time. And so we can think of this more as a dysrhythmia between sclerosis and inflammation. Some examples, which I'll go into in much more detail as we go, as I hopefully get into clinical conditions in this series, um, or maybe another whole series I'll make on this. Um, this would be looking at things like migraine. So migraine headache, we know um, there's a couple different theories. The, the, the really main theory now is it's called neurovascular theory. And the idea is that uh, blood vessels around the brain dilate. We also get an activation of things like the trigeminal nerve, which is a major sensory nerve in the face um, and the sides of the head. And um, so we and we get neural depression. Areas of the brain actually go quiet. Um, so what we essentially see is with vasodilation and all the different chemicals that are released. Interestingly, some of these same mediators of inflammation are what we see in digestion after you digest a meal. So and increase of serotonin, CGRP, all these different peptides and whatnot are released after eating normally. 
So we can think of a migraine as a digestive process that has moved up into the head. Um, and it says that the treatment for migraine would be then to look at the organs of digestion and, and look at what might be disturbed there, the liver, the kidneys, the intestines, and so forth. And then how can we intervene that way? So that's an old traditional idea. You treat the liver for migraine or gallbladder for the migraine, for instance. And, um, and I've seen that in clinical practice be very effective. Um, so this idea that, um, you know, inflammation has moved up. Sinusitis could be a similar thing or inflammation to the ears or anything like that. Uh, we have to look down in digestion in the metabolic processes really for their origin. Similarly, for conditions like atherosclerosis, uh, so-called hardening of the arteries and plaque formation, um, we essentially there have, you know, plaques of cholesterol, but also calcium building up on the inner lining of blood vessels. There's a hardening process going on here. And we can think of that as a neurosensory process that is dipping down too much into the uh, circulatory sphere. And uh, there we actually want to encourage more inflammatory processes, warming, dissolving processes to essentially take care of that activity. Uh, and so that would require looking at how we can increase those uh, activities through excretion and whatnot. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll discuss that later in terms of specific therapies. Uh, but the idea here is that, you know, we can always look at any disease process, whether in an organ or a tissue, as a disturbance of these three primary activities. And this is, again, more of a whole system, so-called holistic view, looking from the whole down into the parts. Now, when we look at the seven light processes, I mentioned in the last video, we can think of them as being reflected through and working through various organ processes in the brain itself, the different aspects of the brain, the, um, you know, the, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, looking at the amygdala, the parts of the cortex, the insula, areas like this are all we can say uh, where these seven light processes are active more in a formative way. Um, they, the nervous system itself is relatively lifeless, and I mentioned that's important that we actually, in our consciousness body, strip away life activities to have consciousness. So this idea that our thoughts, our feelings are actually images in our soul, our psyche, and our, our higher bodies as life processes. Um, what is normally unconscious to us in embryologic development becomes more conscious to us as we age, uh, and we experience that as different feelings, our temperaments, and our moods. Um, but we can also look down at metabolism and find these seven, seven life processes reflected into the organ uh, pairs and organ systems I discussed last time. With the organs, and I'll go more into that here today, you know, there are organ processes that are directed more towards the blood. We, in um, traditions like Chinese medicine, we call these more the solid organs. They secrete into the blood, for example, the spleen, the liver, uh, the heart, and so forth. And then we have processes uh, like the intestines, which are hollow, um, which uh, excrete. And so they secrete into a lumen or out of the body. Um, and um, so we have a polarity even within, we can go further and, and look at this polarity within, excuse me, organ processes. So that is um, how these processes reflect into the di different organs. But again, these are activities or higher order processes which are working through matter and not coming from the matter, which means that if you remove some organs like the spleen, you, re you don't have a lot of repercussions here, you need some short-term immune um, repercussions, but those functions are gradually taken over by your lymph nodes. So in a way, the spleen activity, this immune activity, uh, spreads out throughout the body and starts to work through different tissues, but it still retains its function. Um, and uh, maybe not quite as well as when it had the actual organ to work through, but the function is still there. Other organs like the liver, um, you can't take the whole liver out, take parts of it out, um, but um, its functions seem more localized to that particular organ. So again, this is helpful in, in a lot of traditional medicine, such as Chinese medicine, spoke more about organs as functions, not as anatomical uh, structures. Now, a little interesting side note I wanted to throw in here. Um, this is from a more traditional viewpoint, and so for those who are more biomedically minded, this might be a little metaphysical and out there. But, you know, this interesting, this idea in uh, alchemy, often people discuss this concept of the macrocosm and the microcosm. The microcosm is usually uh, taken to be, uh, in the case of medicine, the human being. And it's said that the human being is a reflection of the macrocosm, which would include the earth and everything on it, but also the 
uh, the cosmos. And so the movements of the planets, the stars and whatnot are all reflected internally. And this was a very ancient view. Of course, our modern chemical views say, yeah, sure, the elements that are all out there we have inside our physiology for, for a large part and uh, so forth. But uh, the ancient view went further and said that the cosmic activities are reflected into us. We currently have in our thinking of the solar system, and we usually associate this with the sign of you know, education is the idea that, you know, we have, we have the concept of the sun-centered solar system. So we say that anyone who doesn't believe in that is somehow behind the times. And this is known as heliocentrism. And this came out, this is a very ancient concept, but it's first, you know, really formalized by uh, uh, Copernicus in the, 1400, in the 1500s, and then later developed by Kepler and Tycho Brahe and whatnot. Um, but basically, um, the heliocentric view, you know, says that we have the sun at the center of the solar system and then the planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth with the, with the moon going around the Earth and then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn are all arranged around the sun in not circles, but ellipses. Um, and um, that that is really the kind of you know, basic structure of our solar system. And then beyond that, we have, you know, space uh, outside the solar system and then we can go further and we're in our galaxy we can go outside the galaxy and there are other galaxies and so forth um, so you know that's the sun centered view now a very ancient view said well that you know again there's evidence that this heliocentric idea was uh, you know known in earlier cultures even such as egyptian culture there's some interesting evidence around that uh, but the idea that uh, we take not the sun to be the center, but rather where we are in relationship to space as a human being. And that would be the so-called geocentric model. So we're on the earth and we see the planets moving across the sky, usually along kind of this line known as the ecliptic, which is the plane of the solar system. And they move in relationship to the background stars, which remain relatively fixed. And um, so the idea is that you know, we have the moving wandering planets, the wanderers, and then we have the fixed stars behind them. And it was thought that each, uh, in relationship to the Earth, each planet was essentially not just that star you see in the sky, but rather enclosed a cosmic space. And that space was a sphere, a crystalline sphere in the old Pythagorean philosophy. And then when these spheres moved against each other, they vibrated. And those vibrations are something that we as human beings here on Earth absorb and that they're important to maintain our physiology. Um, and this is the so-called music of the crystalline spheres, music of the spheres of the crystal heaven. The, in the ancient view, the, there were seven known planets. So if we start with, this, with the Earth, we have the Moon, and then uh, Venus, Mercury, the Sun, and then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn was the called outer planets. The Sun was in the middle, and then the inner planets were the Moon, Venus, and Mercury. And uh, so this was, um, a kind of ancient uh, geocentric model. Um, again, educated people today say, well, that's ridiculous. We know the sun is in the middle. Interestingly, mathematically, it doesn't matter what you put as your reference point. It's just the math is much easier when you have a heliocentric model. Um, the geocentric model, you have to introduce all sorts of interesting things with um, uh, different epicycles of the planets and whatnot. So it becomes much more complicated. But for all intents and purposes, I mean, we can put the reference point on Mars or any other planet. So if we just put it on Earth, where you know we as human beings are situated, um, then we see ourselves as sort of bathed within these spaces. Um, some people like Rudolf Steiner have argued that actually the geocentric model is a more accurate description of so-called astral space versus the heliocentric is more the description of physical space. So both are accurate depending on your spatial reference point. Um, now, these planetary spheres and their vibrations were thought to be carried in the physical uh, earthly area arena through different metals. And so, for example, Saturn was associated with lead and Mars with iron and the sun with gold. And that these were all made into remedies in various preparations. Of course, we think of lead as a toxin today, but in extremely di dilute uh, concentrations, you'd say that they, there's some evidence that lead, for example, can stimulate different formative forces, different activities in the cells. It's non-toxic at those levels, uh, but it can stimulate different, um, especially hardening or structuring activities within the cell. Um, and I'll, I can go into that later if anyone's interested. So that's um, more the, the metal connection there. Now, according with the ancient viewpoint, the there were seven basic planets again. The planets such as Uranus, Neptune, and what we call Pluto, which has now been demoted. Pluto is really part of a larger 
belt of planetoids. Um, and so there's many that are kind of like Pluto out there. So it's a whole belt of these smaller planetoids. But what's interesting about the, with Uranus and Neptune is that they actually, their orbital axes are like flattened. They're, they move in this, in the, they're basically parallel with the plane of their movement, which is unlike all the other planets, which are rough, you know, somewhat perpendicular to the plane of, of rotation. Um, and so some have argued that Uranus and Neptune were actually, you might call them cosmic stragglers. They came in later. And so for the kind of thinking around medicine and whatnot and the, the cosmic spheres, it was usually sufficient to think in terms of up to Saturn. And then it was thought that after Saturn, we hit the sphere of so-called fixed stars, uh, the zodiac um, after that. So just interesting sort of historical argument. But the idea here is that the seven planets really represent the seven life processes. And again, what I mean by planet here is not just that, that thing you see in the sky or the, the cosmic body we send space probes to, but rather the entire sphere and the rhythm that that, that planet makes in that sphere. So for example, uh, Saturn has a roughly a 30-year rhythm in its orbital cycle around the sun. Uh, Jupiter has roughly a 12-year rhythm and so forth. And so these rhythms were thought to be encoded within our very physiology. We're beginning to discover now in the field known as chronobiology that indeed all of our hormones and processes, they do have rhythms. We have the circadian daily rhythm, that's the solar rhythm. And then we have all these other sub-rhythms, slower and faster, which regulate our physiology. So we might think of them as images of these outer activities. So just one interesting idea to sort of put the human being back into context. In the um, alchemical traditions, traditions in the 15, 16, 1700s, there were alchemists such as Robert Flood, um, who really saw the human being as really a condensed image of these cosmic activities. So we think of the solar system crunched down into the body, we get our organ systems, we get all of these things. So our sun, for example, our heart, for example, is our inner sun. Our Jupiter, inner Jupiter is our liver process. And again, there's a reflection of that up in the head. We might think of our hypothalamus pituitary is our liver up here. Uh, is the is the Jupiter up here, and then our liver process and metabolism of Jupiter down there. So just an interesting way of thinking around that. Again, a little bit more of a metaphysical side note. But again, I think these kinds of ideas put the human being back into the context of the cosmos. It's interesting how today we think uh, there's no connection between what's going on in the solar system, uh, the conjunctions of the planets, the aspects of the planets, and human health. Um, but, you know, that's a certainly an interesting area to explore. Now, a little bit more on organ processes within each organ, such as the liver system, for example, which really I would say is a pair here. So we can think of the liver and gallbladder as a pair as one example. Um, we have essentially those threefold activities. So we have more the metabolic activity of the organ, um, and that's related to, you know, processing of foodstuffs and working with that. It's more of a warming. Uh, also, maybe we can think of an excretory activity related to that organ. And this occurs largely in the hollow organs. And then we have more of the nerve sensory head-like activity, which is more seen in the solid organs, where these organs really prepare the blood. They put information into the blood. So we can think of the liver you know, of course, putting foodstuffs in the blood, you know, things like human protein and whatnot, but it also secretes hormones. Uh, and we now know that all of these organs secrete hormones into the blood. And so they have a regulatory forming aspect. And we can think of that as the more the neurosensory aspect. And this secreting into the blood is known, we can call this increasing as the opposite to excretion. And then there's a rhythmic balance in each organ related to, um, their, uh, you know, the rhythms of circulation, the respiratory rhythms, but also the biological, the chronobiological rhythms I just uh, talked about. Um, there are organ clocks, for example, gene clocks, which regulate these activities. Um, so an interesting example is if we look at the liver gallbladder again, we, we find that the liver itself, if you just look at it, histol if you cut it open and look at it under, you know, close up, you find that the cells in the liver, the so-called hepatocytes, are arranged in these roughly hexagonal uh, clusters called lobules, the so-called liver lobule. And each lobule has at the middle a central vein which drains into you know, the vena cava back into uh, central venous circulation. And then we have at the uh, apices of the uh, hexagon, the so-called portal triads, which consists of a hepatic artery which brings fresh blood into the 
into the liver, a branch of the portal vein, which is bringing blood that's been absorbed from the intestines, so all the nutrients that came in are being released there, and then a bile duct. Now, if you look at the hepatic artery and the portal and the little branch of the portal vein, they're secreting roughly from the outside of the hexagon through all these little plates of liver cells, the hepatocytes, towards the central vein. Hepatocytes will take up the nutrients from the intestines, the glucose and amino acids and whatnot, process them, and then put them back into circulation. And, um, and so that's one direction of activity within the hepatocyte. There's another direction where hepat specialized hepatocytes called cholangiocytes will secrete, will create bile. And they will secrete bile into little bile ducts, which move from the inside out of this liver lobule towards a little branch of the bile duct. And that's going to be excreted into the you know, intestines and the gallbladder is a little sac that can store that on the outside of the liver. Um, so basically, there's two directions of activity. So if we just focus on processes within the liver, we have one that's going from the outside in, uh, more of a contracting head-like gesture, and then one moving from the inside out, more of an expansive metabolic gesture. The contracting inner gesture is what we might call liver, the liver process. And then the expanding outward gesture to the bile and the bile ducts and whatnot, that's more gallbladder. So again, cutting out, removing a gallbladder doesn't stop the gallbladder process. It still continues in your liver. You still secrete bile. It's just not maybe stored as, as efficiently, although the so-called common bile duct will enlarge often after a cholecystectomy when you remove, remove your gallbladder and will store extra bile. Um, and so it can develop, redevelop some of those functions. So the gallbladder process still continues even after surgery. Um, so, you know, this, this is this organ pairing, one moving towards the blood, more incretory, more head-like, and then one excretory, more limb-like metabolic is seen in a lot of organs. So kidney and bladder, for example, we see it in the pancreas. Um, so a lot of these organs actually have this sort of polarity. And some of these, like the spleen and stomach, this polarity is spread out to two different organs. And um, so we can start to see these functions map through different tissues. Um, but if we start, if we keep our eye on functions and we see it's, it's actually fairly simple how a lot of these things are working, even though they, the parts that they work through are quite complex. Um, so these are, you know, some of the organ pairs. And I think uh, the organ pairs I'm listing here are the ones that are often discussed in Chinese medicine. And that's because in, in Chinese medicine, I think there was much more of an emphasis on the functions, the processes versus the anatomical structures uh, of these activities. So the spleen stomach, which relate to the uh, endocrine and exocrine pancreas, the liver gallbladder, as I just discussed, kidney bladder, heart and small intestine, lung and large intestine. I discussed that in relationship to that polarity between the, the different parts of the body. Uh, and I'll go into each of these uh, you know, in the future. Now, within each organ, the another thing to grasp is that we essentially have uh, four levels of organization. So we can discuss an organ from the aspect of its physical self, the physical organ, um, and that's what we do typically in anatomy and also down to the cells. This is called histology. So we can look at gross anatomy and histology, um, and uh, that is the solid organ. And that can be studied by cutting it up. We can look at it in the microscope. We can look at it in the cadaver lab. That's the physical organ. But then we have a life organ, which works through all the fluids of that organ. And that's essentially tied in with the physiology of the organ, all the functions, um, the activities that that organ participates in. Um, and uh, this works, again, through the intracellular fluids, but also extracellular fluids in the extracellular matrix through the biological rhythms that are happening there. Um, and this is what we might call using that more imaginative language from anthroposophy and theosophy, the so-called etheric organ. And then there's the what we might call the psychological organ. So I've alluded to this idea that our different psychological states are actually uh, painted or influenced by our organ systems. Um, and again, we're finding the each organ has neurons, sensory neurons that bring information to the brain and uh, this creates sort of an inner temperament or coloring of your, your general mood. So if there's an imbalance in the liver, or the kidney, or whatnot, and we all epigenetically or genetically have differences in the way these organs work. So we all have different types of inner moods and temperaments based on those organ activities. Uh, and so we can describe an organ, each organ is having its own psychological state. And when we spot those states clinically, then we can begin to hone into that organ 
uh, for, for additional treatment. And we can call this the so-called astral organ uh, using that uh, theosophical or anthroposophical language. So that's a third dimension to an organ. And then finally, we have what we might call the spiritual organ. Um, and that's the mental organ or the archetype of the organ. And this is a very interesting ancient idea that we use these organs essentially as carriers for our higher spiritual forces. So our own individual human spirit, our I, borrows the organ processes to be here in the physical world. Um, but it says that all of us have the same, we, our livers have the same liver spirit. So that's why we can talk about the liver more generically versus uh, talking about a human individual. We have to talk about that person and their own individual characteristics. But each liver, we can say, is part of a universal liver archetype from this way of thinking. And um, this works more to the warmth organ, and it's related to circulation um, and, the, and the forces that come through circulation. So this is what we might call the ego or eye organ. But essentially, each organ is part of the more of a universal uh, archetype. And uh, in traditions such as Chinese medicine, these are sometimes referred to as the organ officials. Uh, and these officials essentially are what stand uh, is an archetype over the organ. And often when the organ is, is damaged or ill, we can think of it as having lost its connection with that higher archetype. And so this is one idea in therapy to try to realign it this way. The mixture of all these different activities is what creates the inner terrain of the organ as I discussed a few lectures ago. So just like the whole body can have a general terrain, each organ can have an inner terrain. And the very importance of this is that therapies to treat an organ have to distinguish, or when you're treating an organ clinically, you have to distinguish what is the terrain of that organ. Is it more of a hot terrain? Is that, we can say, the warmth force is working too strongly into the organ, and do we need to then cool it in a way? Or is it too inactive in its excretory activity? Are the nerve activities that stimulate excretion, are they underactive? Do we need to stimulate the autonomic nerves to really be more active in there? Uh, and do we need to maybe moisten or dry the organ in this way? So essentially, um, this is where the old traditional medicines, which talk about hot, cold, dry, damp, and so forth, tension, wind, you know, these are describing the, the tissue states of the whole body, but we can go even further and differentiate tissue states in each organ. And in traditions such as Chinese medicine, especially Chinese herbal medicine, um, there are specific herbal formulations for each organ pattern. Uh, each state of the organ terrain. So it's not enough just to say treat the liver and to say we have to treat the liver maybe a dampness state or a warmth state. And so that's where the idea of terrain comes in. But with each organ that I explore, I want to go through each of these four levels of organization uh, from the ones we're maybe more familiar with, the, the anatomical and physiological, to the psychological, and we might call the mental archetypal organ. Now, the last uh, little concept I'm going to get in this uh, deliver here is the idea of, again, anatomical group, of anatomical versus functional grouping of organs. So if you look at, you know, if you study physiology, anatomy physiology, you're given a list of usually 11 organ systems, uh, cardiovascular, respiratory, digestive, skin, endocrine, nervous. And, um, you know, even in natural medicine circles, we then discuss, well, there are herbs for the skin, there are herbs for the nervous system, herbs for the immune system, and so forth. Uh, what I'm arguing here is that actually that's a secondary or sort of an artificial grouping. Um, if you go back to this idea of organ functions, more of a functional grouping, then we can say there are seven organ processes. And again, I've just put here the idea that they relate to, in the old traditional thinking, the seven spheres of planetary activity. Again, that's maybe more of a metaphysical concept that some are not comfortable with, but I'll just throw that out there. Uh, but the idea that... Um, we have these seven primary life functions working through the organs, and they maintain all of your organ systems. So organ systems such as the skin, when we have a skin lesion, psoriasis or eczema or whatever it is, the question to ask is which one of these seven functions it needs to be supported? And so often then when we support the skin, we have to support the lungs or the kidney or the liver, depending on which one of those functions might be uh, most disturbed. And so that's saying that there really are no herbs for the skin or treatments for the skin directly, but we treat the organs and then via the organs, then we heal the skin. Similarly, the same for the musculoskeletal system. And in fact, in traditions such as Chinese medicine, the musculoskeletal system is really seen as being constructed by the organs. Uh, so each uh, organ is associated with a so-called meridian or channel 
through which um, you know different types of activities circulate through. And um, these are partly related to the nervous system, but also to the circulatory system, and that those channels are spread out amongst different muscle groups. And so, you know, looking at these charts of meridians, we can see certain muscles in the arms and the legs are correlated with specific organs. And if we have disorders of those muscles or the bones underneath, we can start to look at individual organs to support versus specific treatments for the musculoskeletal system. So I think that's an important distinction, which often gets confused even in natural medicine circles. Um, and so it actually makes it a little bit simpler. It says really for any of these systems, we have to look at which of the seven functions are, are deranged uh, or disordered. Um, you know, even within organs like the liver, we have a liver disease like cirrhosis or hepatitis. We can then look at and ask which one of these seven functions is most disturbed because we have the seven reflected into each organ. Again, that's that holarchy idea. So, you know, different traditions have described different levels of this holarchy, and that's where it gets very confusing when you start to try to put all of these and synthesize them together. But if we keep the bigger picture, we can say that the we can keep looking at smaller and smaller divisions, but they still reflect the whole. Um, you know, for example, I've, I've worked with many asthma patients, and one of the uh, aspects I often find there is that the so-called kidney bladder process is what is most disturbed in asthma patients. And so supporting the kidney bladder, which includes the adrenal glands, actually has an important uh, uh, remedial effect on asthma. So just one idea of thinking more salutogenically than just saying, well, there are specific treatments for asthma and we treat the lung only. Uh, we have to look outside the lung really as to which of these functions uh, needs to be most uh, uh, worked with. Okay, so that's a little bit uh, on um, organ processes in the general sense. In the next lecture, hopefully, I will uh, introduce the first organ pair, the so-called spleen and stomach uh, pair, with, and discuss a little bit about this process. And what I'm referring to is the archetypal Saturn process and, um, and what that, how that manifests in our metabolism, but also in our neurosensory system and um, how we might spot that and recognize that clinically. So that's all for this lecture. If you like the content, feel free to like the video and uh, subscribe if you want to hear more of this. And if you subscribe, you need to hit the notifications bell so that you know every time I post a new video, if you want to keep up with that. And then uh, feel free to share the videos as well. So uh, that's all for this. Thank you for listening.